Hello everyone and welcome to the Everything Accordion podcast. A podcast where we talk to accordionists, composers, musicians and music in the broader sense. I am your host, Gennady Rotari, an accordionist myself, but also a musician with lots of different interests. I wanted to thank you for listening to this podcast for following it. It's absolutely amazing seeing the podcast grow basically every single week. I also really appreciate every one of you reaching out and supporting the podcast and commenting on the episodes, sharing these episodes. It's absolutely amazing. And if you haven't done so yet, make sure to follow the podcast wherever you're listening to it. You can also rate and review the podcast. That way, It's suggested by the algorithms to everyone who might be interested in listening to this podcast. And now, let's dive into this new episode. Welcome to another episode of the Everything Accordion podcast. Today, I am excited to talk to a musician and accordionist from Bosnia and Herzegovina, whom I've heard a lot about. She was also present at some master classes and some workshops in Trieste when I was already kind of out of the conservatory. So I didn't have the pleasure of meeting her in person, but I'm really grateful that she's able to to be here today. So today on the podcast, we have Belma Sharancic. And Belma, thank you for being here and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, dear Gennady, for having me in your super podcast about accordionism. It's a great pleasure, and I was always interested and fascinated in the broad area of your work also as a researcher and also Alexander Technique, and I would really love to talk about some of these things today on the episode, but I would like to start with how did it all began for you? Like, Do you remember the moment where you saw the accordion or you heard the accordion and you, you knew that you wanted to... To play it yes uh, well it, it is the question we all get uh, in, in some uh, late ages uh, well for me the accordion well, was really colorful instrument and, and different from all other things that surrounded me when i was six i got my first accordion as a toy and i thought um, i always wanted to be different from other kids to have different things and to play different things so i guess uh, that spirit of mine uh, was the main thing why the accordion was the starting instrument uh, of my life but uh, one year after the war started in bosnia and herzegovina and when i was seven uh, and I was all the time in Sarajevo on the first line of, of all the war um, siege. And the accordion represented through all those uh, four years of <clears throat> Sarajevo siege, uh, the only way out for my soul, for my mind. And it represented some new uh, colorful paths that I couldn't see or I couldn't breathe uh, during the war. So it was my ticket, my mind ticket from the war uh, during those four years. And of course, after that, uh, it simply became my life uh, through the education. And after through my job, uh, it um, began to be my passion and my mission. Uh, to play and to teach and to uh, put every day some new levels of my knowledge of the accordion, accordion playing and psychology of being an accordionist. It's very fascinating uh, now that you are talking about the war times and the accordion being a companion to help for tough times. I remember I had... Uh... Serbian accordionist Dragana Kuzmanovic, who was talking about the similar experiences during the the war and the bombings, and yeah. I find it, yeah, um, really fascinating for many people that the accordion becomes as a sort of companion in tough times, as you said, a ticket, a mind ticket out of reality almost, and immersing yourself in this world, and. Uh, yeah, so afterwards you followed on to 
study, you followed a very, um, I would say for us accordionists, well, nowadays it's more canonical, but a sort of non-canonical way uh, for your time. Mm -hmm. You also, of course, you studied, did the equivalent, I believe, of bachelor's and master's, but then you also went into research and PhD. I believe you were the first accordionist in the area who had a PhD. And how, yes. how did that, was it a natural transition or did you have something in the back of your mind that you wanted to research and to uh, get to, well, the, to the bottom I, of? Yes, um, through all my life, even, even now, I always um, am going uh, to maintain the most of one day you can maintain uh, from your knowledge, from uh, being what is mission of us accordionists to be. Uh, so during my education, it was non-standard education, I could say. Uh, first of all, when I finished my high school uh, in Sarajevo, there was no accordion department in our music academy, but there was accordion department in East Sarajevo, in Republika Srpska. Uh, so I was maybe the first one uh, from the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina who went to East Sarajevo for the knowledge for accordion playing and finished my bachelor degrees there. And I had great opportunity to collaborate with great professor Daniela Gazdic and she mentored me through my bachelor degree. After that, I went to professor Radomir Tomic from Kravljevac on my master's degree and it was really one hard working master degree that lasted for two years, had four um, classical concerts during those uh, two years. And it was really one uh, tough and great experience for me that taught me a lot. After that, I started working parallel uh, when I was uh, going to the master's degree, uh, but I wanted more. I wanted more to investigate what accordion can do and can be. But uh, in the meantime, I started feeling some pain in my spine and in my uh, fingers and in my muscles that prevented me to go further. Uh, I was tapping in one place, you know, like blank totally. Mm -hmm and how to play uh, during next years, how to play all my life when I cannot. My, my body says uh, I'm, I'm stopped. Uh, I have to make a pause and I hated to make pauses in, in knowledge and in my career. So I tried finding another path. What can I do now? What, what to do when I'm standing in front of the white wall and I cannot go further? Uh, then I googled, 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 and found amazing Claudia Yakamuchi, uh, who had and has still uh, the academy that lasts for one year, like a specialization in course of Alexander Technique and accordion playing. Then I decided not to pause my work, but to come to Italy uh, with my work and with everything. Uh, on a monthly period, and I started to collaborate with Claudio Yakomucci and his uh, spouse, Kathleen Delany, and that one year of specialization in Italy gave me lots of benefits, lots of knowledge, uh, lots of awareness of our body and how we play what we play. Because uh, during the regular education, I think especially here in Balkans, very few people uh, pay attention to how we play, you know. It's important only to what mm -hmm. we play. You know, play, 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 compete, give concerts, compete, give concerts. But our spine, our fingers, it's only important to be fast, fast enough to play, mm -hmm. fast to compete on competitions. But nobody asks you, uh, do you have any pain? Does it hurt, you know? And if it hurts, you just get extracted out of the first league and next one comes, you know. Um, mm -hmm. That is why that specialization with Claudio Yakomuchi was so much benefit to me on the field of awareness, on the field of how to give the maximum of your body, how to be maximum aware 
of uh, every single centimeter of your body with uh, whom you play. So uh, after that specialization, uh, I started working as assistant on Music Academy of Sarajevo. We finally got the department. And again, I wanted to go one step higher in my education. So uh, we started the first one in Balkans with artistic PhD. So the Music mm-hmm. Academy of Sarajevo was the first one that started but started the full PhD course. What does it mean? We have many specializations that are only focused on playing the accordion, but there are no artistic researchers on the, those PhD um, degrees. So Sarajevo Music Academy started that PhD program on which half of time we were playing the concert, giving, etc., etc. But half of our PhD dissertations was focused on uh, writing artistic thesis in research of artistic field that we were presenting in our accordion concerts. Uh, so that's why uh, I decided for my artistic research to be Alexander Technique that will be connected to my mm-hmm. uh, accordion uh, concert repertoire that I was playing during those two years of PhD. My mentor there was Geert Dragswell from Copenhagen, and I'm very proud of that collaboration. It was really, really, uh, really great for me, and I really learned a lot, especially on contemporary music, uh, on collaborating with composers, with orchestra, and integrating the Alexander Technique in every aspect of that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, as I said, non-canonical, especially, you know, since we are, as you said, we are very focused on, I was thinking about this the other day when I was looking at the competition in Castelfidardo and the Coupe Mondiale and the whole discussion about the competitions. And for many people, especially during student years, the career goal, let's say, is to participate in as many competitions as possible and get as high as possible. For some reason, we're still, well, less and less of us, but still we're fostering this idea that, you know, if you participate and you win the competition, then somehow you will have a career that you want. But um, it's not entirely true, first of all. Second of all, a great amount of stress, physical and psychological, goes into preparation of the, the sorts of competitions where you're put in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you need to bring out the best you can from yourself. And that, even if you are a very you know, calm and chill person, it still it, it brings this pressure about. And yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very fascinating what you're saying, but it wasn't really based... Let's say that it's more about the what and not the how. Now it's more mm-hmm. of the how and the what, which is really great. And you opened up a couple of topics which I would like to talk about. So the first one is health, definitely, because I think this is the first time on the podcast that we can go into depth and also with an expert in in the topic uh, about um, health I remember I did the course when I was an Erasmus student in Helsinki. Claudio Iacomucci came to to Helsinki and he worked with us a little bit demonstrating um, the principles that he puts into action when performing and when using the Alexander technique when playing. And also uh, the straps, the accordion straps that he engineered, let's say, created for for the accordion and mm. for the people who don't know anything or have heard but don't really understand how alexander technique works could you please explain in some simple way for us how alexander techniques impacts especially as musicians yes i must say first of all that i am not alexander technique teacher i am the one who finished alexander technique course and I'm the one that inherited the Alexander Technique principles, and I am putting them in my uh, work with my students. 
but officially I'm not uh, competitive enough to teach Alexander the King is that. But of course, I can give you some uh, overall inputs of what does Alexander Technique teaches uh, to all of us uh, and especially to accordion players. Why am I always saying when I'm lecturing, it's important for us accordion players, it's important, it's important. Uh, well, from the first graders, you know, when we are seven or eight, they put accordion on us and nobody tells us how to sit, you know. Everybody tells us how to play, or what is um, C major, what is E major, but nobody tells you what are the consequences if you sit, you know, like this, if you put your head like this over the accordion, if you place your hand like this, you know, and not like this. What are the consequences? You know, kids are always like, just let me play. It doesn't matter if I sit like mm -hmm. this. It doesn't matter at all. You know, I can lay on my accordion, watch TV, some game. Da, da, da. It doesn't matter. It does matter a lot. Uh, especially during puberty, uh, when kids get uh, tall, all of the sudden, the spine takes huge damages from playing accordion. For maybe three, four hours a day at their age, uh, the spine uh, suffers a lot. Uh, during my PhD, I made a first trial uh, in the music academy students of all the instruments. Uh, did they experience any pain? Because when I was studying, I was the only one that uh, said, I have pain, I can't play. Mm -hmm. And I felt like alien. Nobody was reporting any pain during playing. Not violin, not flute, not accordion, nobody. And I said, okay, uh, now when I'm a professor, we will go to anonymous one survey and see, is there pain? But anonymously, just let me know, am I lunatic? Or there is really pain uh, among, the accord uh, among the music academy students. And the results, they were devastating. 70% of our students had pain during their playing. Wow. And only 5% of them went to get medical care and nobody ga uh, gained treatment that helped them during all the time. Because when you go to the medical treatment and you say, I have pain in my arm, I'm saying, or in my spine, the first thing the doctor will say, rest. You know, rest, rest for mm -hmm. one month, rest for two, and it will go away. Super, but I have competition in 15 days or concert in 20 <laughs> days. I can't rest. I yeah. need to play, so give me something to play. And then they say, okay, there are corticosteroids. We can give you corticosteroids. Mm -hmm. Or you just need to cancel the, the concert or competition. And that's when musicians play with their life, you know. They go to corticosteroids, mm -hmm. they can be or worse than good, you know, and they can damage your whole body mm -hmm. if not properly. Especially because there are very few doctors, none in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that are experts in music uh, pain history, you know. Uh, we have sports mm -hmm. doctor for sports injuries, but none for the uh, music injuries. And they should be really treated like the sports injuries, but on the no. other hand, yes. Uh, so, Alexander Technique is a technique that all of people from the world should inherit in their consciousness of being, only being, you know. What does it teach you? First of all, it came from Friedrich Matthias Alexander, who was Shakespeare actor in 19th century in Australia. So, during his acting, you know, he experienced sufferness in his throat. But only during acting, you know, he was like, no voice at the stage. And he started investigating what was going on. He went to one doctor, doctor would say, everything is perfect with your throat. There are no injuries. He went to the other doctor, nobody gave him a solution for his pain. And he suffered a lot because he couldn't act at all. Then he closed himself into his room and surrounded himself with mirrors all around his body. And then 
he started investigating what the hell is going on when he is acting. And he found out that when acting on those mirrors, you know, he didn't have mobile phones, you know, to, uh, to picture himself. He found out that he was, yeah, he was backing his throat while speaking, but on the stage. And during this, subconsciously, you know, he started to feel these pains in his throat and his voice cords were starting to feel <clears throat> really grumpy. So then mm -hmm. he found out that uh, the consequence of our non-conscious uh, non behaviors are, uh, most, uh, are causing most of our pain in our body. That's why the Alexander Technique main principle is raising self-awareness of our spine, of our neck, and um, introducing primary control to whole our body. For saying like in really simple words, we should have the spine, the posture, and the walking of a baby of two-year-old. If you observe a baby that is only two-year-old, you will see, but without mobile phones or tablets, you will see that she is sitting right firmly with her spine fully to the up, with her neck totally connected to her uh, spine and with the head totally free from the neck. And that is the main posture that we lose during growing up. Reading books, looking to our cell phones is doing this to mm -hmm. us, you know. Mm -hmm. Is disconnecting our neck from our spine, is disconnecting the whole circulation of our oxygen and our blood through the body, especially during any activity. Activity of walking, 80% of people are walking not aware of where their body is during walking, you know, that's why we are walking like this, you know, putting our mm -hmm. head while doing laundry, doing dishes, doing everything, we are not aware where is our body. And now we are coming to the main benefit during playing accordion. We have no idea where our spine is. We know where our music is, where our mm -hmm. notes are, but we are not aware during especially practicing time where our spine is. Uh, during also PhD, after first survey among the students, I took another survey uh, with um, engineers and I wanted to prove how much energy does accordion expects from our body. And then we did research with some machines, with some uh, everything that uh, were maintained to uh, measure the amount of energy caused by lifting and playing accordion. Mm -hmm. The final result of our really huge research was that lifting accordion from the ground, which we do every single time when we need to uh, put our accordion from the ground to our knees, you know, and then put it on mm -hmm. our shoulders, is 10 times more than our spine can take. You know, the natural, wow. from the natural that our spine can take, lifting a cord, so those 15 kilos from the ground and putting it from this position, you know, when we are sitting, mm -hmm. we sit and then we take a cord, it's 10 times more than our spine is produced to uh, can take. Especially mm -hmm. the bellows from our you know, left side and to the back, takes uh, seven times more energy than the spine can take during here. Mm -hmm. So we usually accordion players have traumas here and here's blockades through here, uh, inflammatories of our nerves in our shoulders, in our elbows, in our tattoos and tendons. Uh, mm -hmm. So why it is so important to give all the pedagogues uh, the main ground zero, you know, at the accordion playing should be the posture of accordion on the kid's body. Because when the posture is right from the seven-year-olds, you know, there are really less and less opportunities to be damaged during the future. 
that uh, when the child gets 15 years of bad education, it's not bad education, it's unconscious education about mm-hmm. where Freudian should be and how to play and how to give the maximum of his body, then we have a problem with that kid and with his body. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Something that I was thinking about, you know, we call the accordion or any musical instrument that we play our instrument. But in the end, actually, our first instrument is our own body. And if we don't master that first instrument, playing the musical instrument will be more tough. And um, sub- I don't know, subconsciously, or maybe consciously, after my experience in, in Finland, um now that I'm thinking about working with the kids or when I see a bad posture, like I immediately the first thing that I do is go and go there because I see and I can imagine how it feels to be like in that position with the instrument maybe on your right leg, you know, the keyboard, especially like with piano accordions. And then it just shifts the entire position sideways and um yeah but this about the spine is fascinating and also when you when you go to a doctor as you said uh normally they would ask you what do you do oh i'm a musician oh stop that immediately you know like stop playing <laughs> and, and the pain will go away and you're like yeah uh, how do i explain that it's my job it's it's funny and ac- actually why do you think is it that you know, we don't treat, because you're right, like, um, our bodies, also, I don't know how to formulate this correctly, I just have many ideas, so I'll, I'll go one by one. Um, like, in sports, one would do warm-up, at least, like, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, for, for the body. What we would normally do as a coordinator we just sit, take the instrument, and start playing immediately without warming up at all our bodies. Yes, uh, you said the the right uh, chord uh, of our problem. Uh, For the kids uh, on the Balkans, warming up our scales. You know, they sit Mm -hmm. and the master says, let's warm up with the scales. I think it's so bad because nobody teaches you to warm up without the accordion, like sports one does. You know, when the football Mm -hmm. player gets out, he first warms up without the ball and then he starts playing, you know. But the accordion player sits with the accordion, you know, and then warm up. Well, the tendons are, are not at all warmed up and they are so exposed to the injuries that it hurts my uh, my heart. So the first thing uh, that we should do before playing, before putting accordion on us is warming up without the accordion and that's the essence you know uh, stretching our tendons stretching our tattoos our shoulders our back spine uh, my assistant on the music academy Azmir Halilovic is now preparing a book about the warm-up uh, first book about accordion warm-ups without accordion a really great book that I hope will be useful for lots of new generations are um, about to come and for us the old ones uh, so those exercises should be done every time before playing any instrument you know but mm-hmm. what is the main problem time you know we have kids mm-hmm. I mean that are, I will say again, um, so inflamed with this, you know, the cell phones, da, 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 mm-hmm. da, and they have like one hour of practicing time, you know, and when you say you get 10 minutes to, to warm up now fingers like this, like this, like this, like this, he's like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't have time for that, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you I have only one hour now. I will only play, etc., etc. And that is how we get into the never-ending circle of injuries and pains, because there is never time for the warm-ups. And I think it's mm-hmm. the basic when the kid to the class. For example, I have a seven-year-old daughter, and she plays drums, you know. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay, the drums 
it's not a core game. You have only the bats, you know, and hmm. you play and that's it. And from the perspective, and she sang, you know. And the first thing the professor said to her, okay, so you will practice half an hour a day, that 10 minutes are warm-ups and 20 are practicing. And I was like, mm-hmm. wow, something is changing. Something is changing to the good. So I was fascinated and really happy to see that professors are changing their way of uh, per- perceiving the body, perceiving the pain, you know, and perceiving how important our physical health is for our playing. So when I saw the warm-ups are now finally into the system and now finally are um, aware by the professors, I was really happy. And now the only thing we need to do is to put that in accordion and not only in trance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I can send appeal to all the accordion professors. Please do have at least five minutes of your class from 45 minutes on the warming up exercises that are available online, that are available anywhere. Uh, so to give, uh, uh, first of all, the professor needs to have nerves and times to observe mm-hmm. the warming up five minutes. When the kid sees that professor is so much persuasive in those warming up exercises, he will do them at home. But if professors are, okay, did you do the warm ups now? Let's go playing, let's go on the scale, let's go at you, blah, blah, blah. then the kid will mm-hmm. not do warm ups at home. So always have five, ten minutes of warm ups before starting the lesson. And then we will have less injuries. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now I now that I think of it, I should start incorporating that with, with the kids to to whom I teach. Um yeah. The reason is, as you say, it's a little bit the time and our times because everyone is so fast that it's just like, you know, what, 10 minutes of like finger stretching or five minutes of finger stretching kind of gets boring in a way for for them. But it's it's a very good discipline also on the long run because if you think that they need to stay healthy and pain-free, then... Absolutely, this five minutes, which is nothing in a day, um, yeah. can drastically improve and change the quality of, uh, of also the experience. Because I, f- I believe that many many kids at one point they arrive and they're like, "Oh, it's painful. Oh, it's so you know, it creates discomfort. I really don't want to continue this torture <laughs> with the instrument." <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we're like, "Okay, I'm gonna go and do something else." So let's say that for us accordionists, since this is everything accordion podcast, uh, one thing is warm-ups. What are, let's say, your top three to five um, tips or advices to us accordionists on improving our feeling comfortable with our bodies when we play from like taking the accordion up putting it down what are some of the tips i'll I'll just give you a couple of mine which i always like tell my students so this is normal left strap smaller right strap wider so that we have a very good angle so that our forearm is parallel to uh to the floor um what else do do i tell them the keyboard definitely not on the right leg so kind of like a bit beneath um yeah these are a couple of you know observations that i always tell to to my my pupils but what would be yours Uh, well yours are good ones as well (laughs) those are (laughs) the basic ones and you always need to uh to tell them again and again because they forgot Uh, yes yeah yeah uh, well, I always start uh, from the to- uh, from the uh, bottom to the top, you know, from where our legs are. So our legs, when sitting on the accordion, need to be positioned on 90 degrees. So it's common mistake for students to sit on too high or too low chairs. And that's why the accordion goes like through here, you know, or to this, you know, if it's too high or too mm-hmm. low. 
best is for uh, the leg to be positioned on the 90 degrees and then the, the bellows to be positioned on the left leg, sitting properly, yes. Our legs then are firm on the ground, you know. The legs, uh, when positioned, I will now be my leg, you know, like this. Okay, and this is the accordion, okay. Mm -hmm. and so it's easier for like this, okay. Then we are firm on the ground. Many students take position as this, put their legs beneath mm -hmm. them, beneath the chair. Mm -hmm. And I True. always do the experiments. True. I push them uh, on the back and they fall, you know. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And why the legs cannot be like this, but need to be like this. So the podium mm -hmm. uh, stand on the firm, you know, position of the body. That's when we are firm on the ground. The next step when we finish the legs is the spine. The spine should always go to the up, you know. Usually, we bend. Mm -hmm. I know, I will be my spine, okay? So, uh, <laughs> instead of being spine like this, we usually, okay, I will give this hand, we usually do this, you know, bend it like this. Yeah, we curve. Yeah, for, for, for yeah, the we, people who will be listening, <laughs> the audio. Yeah, we, yeah, we curve. curve our spine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Instead of sitting like this, you know, totally firm going up, this is our head on the top, you know, we do this to our mm -hmm. spine. Because of the belts that are going here, you know, and everything, we mm -hmm. do this. And then we lose muscle control. Muscle control is the strongest on our stomach area, you know. And instead mm -hmm. of taking those muscles uh, to work for us, they work against us. You know, and we put mm -hmm. instead of putting burden of accordion onto these muscles of our stomach, we put them onto these really small ones of our spine, and that's how the first okay. damage of our spine comes. You know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if you do this to our spine, then you take the burden of the muscles which are really huge here, you know, and then the spine can rest. And that okay. is the main thing. Sitting with accordion, I always press him uh, down to uh, to be up, 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 spine up. When we finish mm -hmm. spine, we finish our legs, spine. Then we come to our shoulders. Usually, mm -hmm. the accordion plays because of our straps that goes here. Sit like here, you know, and put their head, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, head, like this, you know. So I say yeah. shoulders should be like eagle, you know, like bird eagle. Mm -hmm. I always say, imagine your accordion that you are to it, you know. So going wide mm -hmm. with your hands, and then you have natural position when imagining your eagle onto the accordion, you know, mm -hmm. one eagle. Yeah. But usually it's like so yeah, usually it's eagle the swan. So <laughs> yes, exactly. And your head should always face up, up, not down, mm -hmm. not like this, not uh, watching what your right hand does, no, mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Because that is when the brain is full with oxygen. When you put mm -hmm. this, you break it here or here, break it. Okay, so you know, creates tension on the neck. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Then, mm -hmm. when we have from the bottom to the top, you know, uh, positioned our body to the accordion, the most uh, important thing is to be comfortable with the accordion. You said about the straps. Yes, most of the time, the left should be smaller, the right should be bigger, uh, because uh, right should enable the right hand to go uh, freely over the keyboard, you know. Yes, and the left mm -hmm. should be smaller, Unable to left hand be positioned firmly on the left side, but I always say everything is individual. You have different bodies; Absolutely. nobody is equal. Dimensions of his body, so it should <laughs> always be individual, strapped and tight. Mm -hmm. Because for somebody, those straps are okay. For somebody, mm -hmm. are not. Somebody plays really mm -hmm. good with anatomic straps that Claudia Iacomucci invented. 
Yes, it really suits them really good. And I even seem real comfort doing playing. Somebody is not so comfortable. So everybody should adjust his accordion on his own way so he feels freely mm-hmm. and comfortably doing, during the playing, but able to play uh, long bellows, openings and closings and to uh, be firm on the bellow shakes without accordion dancing on the, to his body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I have like every single one of them great, great tips. Um, now, now what you said about like the you know the, the head going on the bellows, like closing this neck area. Mm-hmm. I was thinking when I was you know uh, um, a teenager or like a young eighteen, nineteen mm-hmm. year old. For for some reason, I wanted to look kind of cool, and you know, like my my note stand would go lower so that. People could see me and my playing and so on. So the ego, you know. Um, and then I remember that uh, Claudio Iacomucci said, oh, uh, he was working with some small, a very young accordion, so around 12, 13. He was thinking, oh, why are you? Oh, right. So then he just, you know, put the note stand, which which sounds like a stupid idea, but it changed completely because then you don't need to look downwards, so you're automatically not uh, curving yourself and also not blocking your neck. It just goes on the same level as the eyesight. You know, I still need to remind sometimes myself about this because it's just so automatic that, you know, as you said, you need to be self-aware of what you're doing. And... Uh, yeah, I have another pupil who is playing the Schweizer Urgeli, so like the Swiss version of the Steirish Harmonica. And at one point I saw that she was so tense in trying to play the, the right notes, but her neck was like completely uh, with her face onwards towards the score. And I was like, do you have any pains? She was like, mm, no, not really. But can you move your neck? I don't know. And when I started like moving her neck a little bit, and it was really blocked in the beginning. And when I told her, "Listen, when you practice, just you know, try and move your neck around to see if you're like relaxing this this area." So yeah, um, when saying that, I usually say uh, you have uh, reminded me many accordions play like this, you know, with their mouth. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, mm-hmm. really st- in their closing mouth the lips and very tight. Mm-hmm. That all tension and stress into their lips, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, often, yeah, I said, and um, play like a fish, uh, uh, you know, like this, play open mouth like fish. And it's really mm-hmm. hard at the beginning, yes, uh, but it helps them uh, really a lot because stiffness in mouth causes accordion not to sink. Uh, you you know, the bellows are our lungs and they need to sing. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually mm-hmm. saying, when you play, you need to sing with your voice, really. I persuade them to sing and they hate it, but it's really good <laughs> exercise. And when they sing, they need to open their mouth and uh, to be relaxed in this area so the voice could come out. And uh, when it's free, the bellows start freely to play with musicality, you know, without stiffness. And it's really important for the students always to uh, remember, you know, all the other instruments persuade um, the bow uh, for Mm -hmm. the uh, string play, persuade the breath uh, for the Mm -hmm. uh, uh, players, you know. But we, we are like, okay, we have uh, notes, you know, we have fingers and the bellow, Mm -hmm. we don't pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, at all uh, but the main important soul of our instrument is that bellow so all the stiffness in our body does it come from the hand from the shoulders from the head or from our mouth will result the bellow to be really stiff and to have mm-hmm. no music in it. so it's really mm-hmm. important uh, to free the students through singing, they are freeing their lungs through the voice, you know. Uh, so when they stop singing and only playing, 
the connection is already there. Their lungs, their mouth, their voice are mm -hmm. into the accordion. And one mm -hmm. thing, they are in their mouth always singing and relaxing their soul. So I think it's really important for them to connect with their bellows mm -hmm. and only with their fingers. True. Yeah, uh, I believe it's also about uh, respiration. So the way we breathe, you know, like when you start um, a phrase, like sometimes I would feel a lot of tension and it's just like eh, the, the sound in the bellows. And I'm like, okay, try first to, as you would say something, you know, and then you start playing and it just changes immediately. Um, yeah, it's it's really, as you say, it's it's a connection. It's a connection with yes, the that's why instrument, and, I, and yeah, the fingers stop. are just means. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm so underlying the technique of singing what you are playing. Because when singing, you need to breathe. And when breathing, your phrases will be natural. So the professor doesn't need to draw your phrases through the parts, you know, and saying, okay, this and this will go through this and this. When singing, it's natural. Everything comes natural because when you lose the breath, okay, the phrase is too long. So let's go where the breath can mm -hmm. go. You play, you know, you need to feel it. And when you feel it, you breathe. Mm -hmm. Without feeling, you don't breathe, you'd only play. And that playing, mm, it's shallow. It doesn't have the depthness mm -hmm. of the book that it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, this this begs the question, why don't we have, especially in our music academies, uh, well, now it's more common to have some courses working with the bodies, but why don't we have on staff someone who is specialized in musicians' therapy, especially the body therapies. I remember in, when I was studying in Munich, they started introducing this, and now it's just a part of the academy. And you can actually schedule a session and go and talk about your, your pains, your, your body functionalities, and everything else. So do you think is it because we are still not into this mindset of using our bodies as instruments at an optimal level, or is it something else? Uh, well, I think the main thing is about neglecting the problem, you know, and the shameness uh, mm. that is on Balkan uh, familiar. As I said earlier, when I was going through the survey at the Music Academy, uh, nobody came to me and said, oh, it's super, I really have pains. Because everybody was ashamed. Because mm -hmm. professor mm -hmm. uh, don't talk about it. And the student think if he talks about the pain that he will be expelled. Or nobody will count on him for the competition, for mm -hmm. the concert, for anything. I mm -hmm. think the main okay. thing uh, at first level is to breaking down the stigma about having the pain as a musician. And that's why we are working so hard at the uh, Music Academy at Sarajevo to talk about it, not feel ashamed and to, to find it normal to have pain and to find it normal to seek the help for that pain, you know. And we have communicated really successful collaboration with medical faculty of Sarajevo University. And we hope at some near time we will be able to have uh, exactly what you had, the help uh, and the, our academy or the course uh, that will help musicians to aware the uh, existing of the problems and to give them uh, the uh, path for solving the problems of their pain. You know, because uh, it's main thing to uh, be aware and to have uh, the means to deal with that pain. So it's a huge mm -hmm. bet. We need to have the medical part that will follow the musicians, you know, to have educated staff that will um, see what the problem is, that will know how to handle the problem of musicians with sports pain, you know? And then mm -hmm. to work on the <clears throat> of music, how to handle and how to treat 
that same problems, pain, because it's not only the physical pain like that. It's more of the psychological side uh, of dealing with the pain, the depression that, that comes with it, uh, the wall that you are facing, the rejection of the society, of the professor, of the competitions, of everything. So it's important to work as well on the physical pain and on the psychological side of what comes with the pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think also like this, you know, something that we all confront in a certain way that could be stage fright or like psychological pressure of performance. Um, in some, especially in the orchestras, it was normal to take, I don't know, some beta blockants so that you don't feel the pressure but then on the long run you just become addicted to that feeling to numbing your uh, stress levels but it's not a sustainable way of dealing and you're right it's neglecting the problem instead of working on it and finding the best solution which is always individual as you mentioned it's not one solution fits everyone um yeah it's understanding uh the root of a problem and working on that in the best case scenario you deal with it and it might go away in the worst case scenario you learn to live with it but you also have the necessary tools to to cope with it in a serene and optimistical way yes uh while i was doing the research uh I investigated that 85% of world symphonic musicians have at least once experienced the pain during their playing and 50% of them needed to stop playing for a month or more because of the injuries. And that data was really shocking uh, because at least... In Philharmonics on Balkans, nobody talks about that pain. And I know, (laughs) I will be not awful, uh, that most of alcoholic peoples are uh, the ones that do on the fly trader and symphonic Mm -hmm. musician. The most Mm. of all, because it's a stressful job, that the most people go to drugs to alcohol because they cannot deal neither the stress, neither the pain. And like you mm-hmm. said, yes, you can get to the beta blockators. Everybody was given, you know, well, feel it, it's no problem. Da, da, da. And when you get addicted, nobody tells you how to handle the addiction then afterwards. So yeah. I yeah. really don't advise anybody, neither the corticosteroids, neither the beta blockators, because everything that is not natural is not sustainable in our body and no, neither in our psychology. Uh, so I think that uh, dealing with it on a natural way, on a self-awareness way, is the best uh, Yeah, when facing the chronic pain, you know, because we have acute pain mm-hmm. and we have chronic pain that are not able to be fixed. Because they usually say that some uh, in one time when something gets damaged in our body, it usually stays damaged during our whole life and it cannot be totally mm-hmm. fixed. So at our musicians, when we get damaged, for uh, example, our carpal tunnel, you know, and usually mm-hmm. get damaged um, the accordion place, it will be damaged chronically, you know. But then mm. you can change your posture, you can change the awareness, you can change your repertoire so mm-hmm. it doesn't go uh, to the techniques that will damage your heart tunnel or you can change your repertoire so not to play the uh, bellow shake, you know, if your uh, nerve is damaged or something like that. So you can adjust your body, mm-hmm. your repertoire, a good healthy musician without any drugs and without so much uh, stress just uh, playing smartly in your life Mm -hmm. yeah now that you said about adapting also repertoire wise it makes absolute sense I never thought about that Um, then again like you know playing the devil's advocate it's immediately this kind of thing oh I'm less of an accordionist if I don't play Mm -hmm. these pieces you know it's it's so ingrained in our 
like minds, you know. So yes. if you don't play yeah. a thousand notes per second, you're you're not an accordionist or whatever, you know. Yes, it's hard to explain, especially to young students, because they are all into drum. You know, I need to play fast. I need to play mm-hmm. quick. Play Semyonov sonata, Nagayev sonata. You know, uh, to be part of the team that plays quick and, and fast. Uh, but if you and I'm okay if you can't play, of course, no, no problem at all. But if you cannot, uh, well, there are so many uh, great compositions that gives you so many ways to um, give your soul, to give your musicality, to show to public uh, what you can do. That there is no need to persuade about your. Uh, physical abilities of your body uh, going to the repertoire that is not uh, able to be played by your body. Uh, so that's what mm-hmm. uh, the professors and the students should be very, 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 very and to choose their repertoire wisely. So, of course, mm-hmm. repertoire cannot be from all the lyrical pieces or all contemporary music, of course not. Uh, but if you want to represent all the styles and uh, many different composers, then I think by wise, uh, choosing wisely, you can do a lot of benefit to your body and to the publics because you can give the best of you to them and uh, they will feel no pain from you. When public mm-hmm. feels the pain and the suffering from the patients, it's not yeah. joy to listen at all. Yeah, absolutely. No, and you could also uh, commission new works and focus on some techniques or some, uh, you know, make make it all, almost custom made for yourself and for your own personal needs. Um, I would really love to talk also about the musical scene in Bosnia and Herzegovina because you worked also with composers. And I can imagine that it flourished in the past uh, 10 years quite a lot, also with you being always present and pushing towards that. I don't know how much time you have to talk about that. Just let me know, or no, no, no. if you would like. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's okay. No problem. <laughs> uh, in Bosnia, yes, the accordion in Bosnia as well, and all the Balkans is very, is very well firm as a national instrument, you know. Uh, so we don't have the problem of the popularity of the accordion. We have the problem of popularity of classical accordion, because mm. accordion is interpreted as the sevda instrument uh, for our folk music instrument. You know, uh, it's really very established as the folk instrument for our traditional music. So on one side, it's a great thing, and we all nurture our Sadalinka and our national folk music, uh, which really has a great tradition. And even we have department for our national music at the Music Academy, and we collaborate really good. On the other hand, classical accordion that is only 50 years old, yeah, and like we know that uh, the accordion today is really hard um to expose to our composers because our composers are classically educated and they always imagine accordion still as folk instrument you know mm. first of all first years they were running away from accordion they were like <laughs> no no it's not a classical instrument that we are uh, educated to to compose and everything but then of course being persuasive and giving many concerts that they could hear many possibilities of accordion can do today. Uh, of course, uh, the things started to change, and now uh, we have more and more um, compositions that are made uh, for accordion from Bosnian composers. Uh, from 10 years ago, we now finally have the first concert uh, for accordion. Orchestra. We have first chamber pieces for accordion and other classical instruments, which we, which we are really proud of. Uh, so I can say that that um, music scene of classical accordion in Bosnia and Herzegovina is starting to change. Is it fast? No, it's not. But uh, step by step, 
uh, we are taking some uh, steps forward to accordion to be side by side the other classical instruments when our composers are at stake because we have really great composers that are now changing their philosophy towards the accordion that I think is uh, also what is happening to, in the all other sides of the world. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right about, you know, and it's also, as, as you said, it's a blessing and it's also a curse in a way, but the instrument is so popular in other areas of the, mu the national music and the presence of the instrument. But at the same time, maybe, you know, for composers who are trying to make a name for themselves as quote-unquote serious composers, associating themselves with an instrument which is super well known as a folk instrument might be a little bit um, risky, maybe, if we put mm -hmm. it like that. But um, yeah, I believe that also like the young generation of composers who see the instrument with its potential and not only its cultural heritage and historical heritage, um, they're more inclined to try and incorporate the accordion. As you said, it takes time. It's a slow process, but as long as it's moving towards something, that's already a really great result. I was thinking about, you know, we accordionists, very often we are very slow in adopting new stuff, also like new repertoire or new... Also, if we might think about the principles of the Alexander Technique, I think Claudia Yakomucci was talking about this, like, I don't know, 10, 10 years ago at least, but maybe even 15, 20. And it's only now that it's kind of catching up and people are starting to think about it, not even implement it. So, yeah, it takes time. It takes work, consistency. Um, but yeah, what are, what are some of the works that you believe are kind of destined from uh, Bosnian composers to become a part of our repertoire or the pieces that should be heard and played more often by the wider community of us accordionists? Well, as I said, uh, you said it all right. Yes, us accordionists, I always say, are like one special kind of people, you know. I cannot compare us to any other instrument players, you know. <laughs> We're really stubborn. Mm -hmm. But I somehow mm -hmm. connect to our instrument as well. Uh, well, if uh, if you ask me, I'm always pro-contemporary music. I'm always for the new stuff, uh, for new pieces that are um, are good, uh, have some meaning, have some program uh, be, that lies behind those uh, notes. So, uh, speaking of Bosnian, uh, new pieces, they are really some good pieces. Uh, from our composers, we have a great piece for accordion and saxophone from Alisher Sijeric. Uh, we have great compositions from Dražen Kosoric. Uh, great uh, concerts from Iman Čavlović. Uh, chamber uh, music from him. So I think those pieces will live long on our scene, uh, especially having in mind their uh, really um, unique musical language that they composed with, because um, all of them are using accordion on some uh, new levels, especially uh, you can compare them, maybe Ali Sjeric uh, with techniques of Toshio Hosakawa that uses accordion mm -hmm. and uh, never-ending and uh, everlasting tone you know, fascinating with that side of the accordion and you have Dražen Kosaric that is always fascinating with accordion possibilities, like technique possibilities, you know. So I mm -hmm. think every composer took some side of the accordion and then um, interpreted it uh, on his own music language. Uh, I'm always persuading also my students to always play some new pieces because uh, new pieces don't only represent a piece, you know. It represents mm -hmm. the state of the world today, the state of composers thinking today. So if you want to mm -hmm. be 
uh, a full musician uh, to understand the music in its all, all aspects, you need to play all visions of music from Baroque till today and to understand the language of music today if you want to be the musician on the stage uh, which is 21st century really demanding stage um, asks you to be uh, so yes I'm always for the new pieces even um, that come from Japan from Copenhagen from France from Brazil because we need to understand uh, all those languages to be able to establish our own language Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's also expanding, you know, our own perception of life. And it's also, I think it keeps the curiosity alive. Something that in our today's world, we were talking about the posture and, you know, like the the exercises and the kids nowadays or the young people nowadays being so used to very fast moving images and information and so on that sometimes just to kind of stop and get deep into something and be curious about something it's cultivating you also as a as a human being and as a person not just you know constantly playing with the same vision or musical language a piece from i don't know uh by let's say is by Lindbergh and then Semyonov and then something else and it's kind of the same uh, yes. perception of the yes, musical that, language. Yes, I often said to my students, we will need to adjust. We will need to adjust to the time today because mm-hmm. when I observe the kids today, but really small kids from 7 to 10 years of age, I am really suspicious about the um, future of mm. the music as general, you know because I see the kids don't have uh, as, how, how could I say they don't see the importance at all of music they don't see what's the point mm. of spending six hours day you know practicing what's the point mm-hmm. of uh, sitting what well, when when it doesn't give me instant filler and instant success because everything mm-hmm. about the kids today is about the instant success and that's what i'm saying yes. okay music will always be but we will need to um, deeply adjust uh, our repertoire our expectations of uh, those kids we will need to give them something that is thrilling always something that will occupy their attention uh, of course they will have to know everything that music needs to be known about but uh, we will definitely need to adjust our repertoire to have the audience and to have the musicians in the future next mm. 20 years Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's curious. I think you're one of the first people that I hear say that because like normally the conversation would be, oh, we would need we need to find ways to kind of educate in a way our audiences. And of course you adapt to the new means of educating the audiences in a way. Uh, but at the same time, you're absolutely right. We will also have to adapt, otherwise we will be like dinosaurs and fossils just like being yes something uh, like that yes i mean uh, i often follow the finland and swedish system of education the global education not music education of the kids and mm-hmm. how they adjust education to the kids and how uh, they adapt w- and how they go with the time you know and with kids' mm-hmm. needs. And uh, somehow I think that music pad will need to go following what the kid needs. You know, instead of the kid following the music, because mm-hmm. as you said, everything that will be left of the music are uh, maybe a uh, few Russians, musicians that will still practice, you know, uh, 12 hours a day. 
uh, and dinosaurs and fossils from all of us from Europe, you know, because um, mm -hmm. I don't see in the eyes of our young generation that will and that persuade to, you know, of practicing, mm -hmm. of living, that of having a mission to play for the, that the music becomes your life. And I see it every fewer from our young generation that in their eyes. And that is what I'm mm -hmm. the most proud of. Yeah, it's uh, some, so some, sometimes in some of my previous pupils. And it, it, it's kind of heartbreaking seeing there's no flame of curiosity. There's no flame of probably because we're young minds are already saturated by so much information and so much stuff and so much stimuli that they receive every single day that, you know, to tell them now develop the patience and be there for one hour and work on this and focus on that, which is invaluable, I believe, like for them to become human beings, because I think like studying music is not only about playing music develops a character, it develops a way of thinking, it develops a personality, it develops an insight into yourself, like being critical and asking questions of yourself, patience, which is a huge one, and nowadays it's less and less, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so yeah, it has so many benefits, but of course, in a society where we all are focused on fast results with less effort possible you know with a press of a button like sitting down for 15 minutes just playing the right hand of a melody or whatever might seem like a huge burden mm -hmm. i couldn't agree more with you i think uh, the same the music is not only pressing the right keys at the right time it's living the music and most of our kids the, firstly, don't want to leave the music, don't see the point of leaving the music, and they want something that they they can become famous for or only for one night, mm. you know. And that is mm -hmm. the main problem. Music is about living all your life and having only the peaks one or there, you know, <laughs> during every once in a month or two. Uh, but the kids are not happy today with that success. Mm. And that, I mm -hmm. mean, there, of course, will always be the kids that, that will uh, do that, but we will, don't, we will not have the quantity to extract quality from it, you know? Mm -hmm. We will have yeah. kids that play. We will always have somebody who will live the music, but we will not have the quantity that we used to have in the past 20, 50 years. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also, you know, by nature, I'm I'm kind of optimistic, even though it's a very pessimistic, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. era for us musicians and for, for those who teach music and work with young musicians. Uh, but I believe, like, like we were talking about the body and the stress, you know, the sustainability of it all. I believe that at some point it will become so much that we will, you know, go into the different direction and um, slow down and work on ourselves. I don't know when that will happen, but I strongly believe that well, that will happen, and that we musicians will play a very important role in in in, in nurturing that. So, yeah, I believe you know. We'll see what time without, bring. <laughs> without music, there is no life. So, of course, music will exist always uh, in our lives and around us. But as I said, we will only need to adjust. And on this note, I believe, Belma, thank you very much for this super interesting and inspiring conversation. I think one of the most important topics uh the health and the approach to the instrument and sustainability of having a career as a performing musician was very interesting very fascinating also with your research and your data where can people find more out about you 
Uh, well, there is my book, uh, The Alexander Technique in Accordionism, that is part of my extract of my PhD research. It's available online uh, through my Facebook page. So anybody interested can contact me um, and get all the data they need. Great. I will link this in the description of this episode. And where can people hear you perform or what, what are some of the projects that you're looking forward to now in the last uh, three months of 2024 and in 2025? Well, uh, we have the Association for Accordion Bosnian Players that is called BARTE. Uh, and all our um, events that are upcoming will be published nearly on the BARTE page. Uh, I say the association only connected to the promoting the accordion, especially uh, the accordion in uh, big orchestras. For example, uh, nearly a few months ago, we maintained Bosnian and Herzegovina record in um, playing uh, 100 accordion at the same time. So wow. that's, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we are doing on that. Uh, and all the projects will be available on that page. Amazing. I will also link that page in the description of the episode. Belma, thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much that you were here today as a guest. It was very interesting, very inspiring, and I really hope to meet you in person somewhere soon. Thank you, Gennady. It was a pleasure being your guest, and thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode. Reach out with comments suggestions, listen to the other episodes if you haven't done so yet. Feel free to reach out to me on social media, send in an email. You can also send in a voice message if you'd like. The link is in the description of the episode right at the bottom. If you'd like to support the podcast, if it brings value to you, if you find it helpful and useful and entertaining or whatever the reason, there's also the option to support the podcast with a small donation, monthly donation. You could also book, for example, a virtual coffee with me and have a chat about whatever it is you are doing. Maybe I am the right person to push you in the right direction. You never know. Thank you again for listening and see you in the next episode.